I don't know about you all, but I feel like there are enough game changers in this room right now that God could set this city on fire with the people that are here. I'm grateful, absolutely grateful for the different churches that are represented here tonight. So this evening, as you all have already heard, as you see on the screen, our topic for our worldview tonight is a a difficult one. We're dealing with racism, hatred, love, and forgiveness. Um, Many of you, when you came in, you might have picked up one of these sermon outline sheets that is right outside on the tables. And on the front of that, it has information that is essential for somebody to understand as well as to develop a biblical worldview. So I encourage people, if you did not pick up one coming in, definitely pick up one as you are leaving. It's a piece that you can read over, and it's not only vital for framing a conversation like what we're getting into tonight, but also so many other issues that believers face in a fallen world. We need to have a biblical worldview. We need to understand what God says about how we are to live and how we are to engage this culture that we live in. So tonight is going to have four primary pieces. And so the first part of this is going to be a welcome, an introduction, as well as an overview. I'm going to share for about eight minutes about why it is that this particular topic, racism, hatred, love, and forgiveness, has to be addressed by the church. If we wait for the world to fix this issue, we're going to be waiting until eternity. There is one that we build our lives upon, and that is Jesus. That is a unifying factor that is in this room, the Holy Spirit of God indwelling the life of the believer who is living in accordance with the Word of God. That type of person can make major changes. We have to address this topic within the church. Also, the second part is going to be an interview with pastors Ken Bevel and Rance Pettibone to Carlo Marcus as well as Trent Corey. I'm going to bring them out in just a few moments. And each of those pastors, when they get out here, they're going to take a seat. They're going to share about one minute of an introduction of who they are, where they serve, and how long that they have actually been serving in that particular place. And after that, there's going to be some personal questions that I'm going to ask individuals and there's some group questions that we are going to work through. So there's going to be a whole interview going on. Then part number three is going to be next steps. For the person who comes in tonight and they say, my heart breaks on this issue. I want to be a part of the solution, but I have no idea where to even begin. Tonight, we want to provide practical, biblical, tangible steps for people to take. You know, we're not going to solve everything tonight, but if we can take several positive steps in the right direction, praise God. We're going to take that as a victory right there. And then the final part of this is we are going to have a time of prayer together as a part of the body of Christ. Body of Christ is not one church. It's not one denomination. It's the kingdom of God. And so we're going to pray as those who are part of the kingdom of God that God uses those in this room, that God uses tonight to take a step forward to bring healing and reconciliation in relationships between churches and so that we can work together for the good of the city that God has called us to serve. So we got a lot happening tonight. We're going to end with worship. It's going to be a good time. I can hardly stand myself. I'm so excited right now. So before I go over in my time already, let me kind of cover some quick pieces. Why is tonight so important? Tonight is about more than a gathering. It's about more than a conversation. It's about more than recognizing that there is a problem. Tonight is a topic that has to be addressed because it impacts our understanding of the gospel And it also impacts how we see what God can do through changed lives. Tonight is one of those topics that we are asking God, help us take a step forward. Help us see from your perspective. May we begin to see that God has called the body of Christ to be a part of the solution here. Also, why are we focused tonight on four topics instead of just one? Got racism. Hatred, love, and forgiveness, like, there's a whole lot going on. So why did we focus on four and not just one part of that? Well, the answer is there's two pieces on the problem side, and there's also two pieces on the solution side. So on the problem side of this, there might be some people who say, 
I don't struggle with racism. If that's the case, praise God. But if a person allows any form of hatred to grow in their heart towards another person or another group of people, that's sin. You might not call it racism in the moment, but that is sin. God does not bless sin and hatred. So another part on this is if we're going to look on the solution side, some people will say, I'm willing to forgive, and I can forget and just move on. And let me just say, praise God that people are willing to forgive. But this is one step in a much longer journey of what the gospel speaks about. The journey of the gospel does not stop simply by somebody saying, I forgive you, but I don't want anything to do with you. That's not the gospel. In fact, I got this one definition I just wanted to bring to you, and that is the power of the gospel is not only displayed in our willingness to forgive, but also in the extravagance of our love. It needs to be that the people of God come together and we not only say we recognize a problem, we want to address that problem biblically, but because of the power of the gospel, what Jesus has done in each of our lives, he gives us the capacity to love each other well and to help reconcile and to be a part of the solution for others. So all that being said, we got a lot that's going to be covered tonight. So what does scripture have to say about the topic of racism, hatred, love, and forgiveness. Well, to frame this conversation biblically, it's important that we understand there is only one race. It's the human race. It's the Adam race. And it is comprised of many ethnicities. So those ethnicities are Hispanic and African and Asian, Indian, Caucasian, Arab, Jewish, just a number of different ethnicities. All people have the same basic physical characteristics. In fact, did you know that literally point or 0.2% difference between any of us in the room, genetically speaking? We're, we're a part of the same race, just differences in beauty in ethnicity itself. It's important for us to also understand when Scripture talks about this topic, we have to frame it in the context of what's called the Imago Dei, the image of God. We, we're going to get into that in just a moment, a little bit more, but racism is culturally defined as prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism towards someone of a different race or ethnicity based on the belief that one's race is superior. Racism is a byproduct of hatred, of fear, of lack of knowledge, and of pride. It is a sin that goes against clear biblical principles that teach on love and compassion, humility, as well as service to others. I need you to hear me before we go any further tonight on this. Racism and hatred are absolutely incompatible with the teachings of Scripture and what we're called to live as a child of God. It, there, it isn't incompatible. There's no excuses on this. They do not align with what is clearly taught in the Word of God. So Scripture very clearly teaches what it says about racism or hatred. So for example, it shows that God does not show partiality or favoritism. Deuteronomy chapter 10, Acts chapter 10, Romans 2, Ephesians chapter 6. Also, showing partiality or discrimination is a sin, very clearly a sin, James chapter 2, verse 4. Jesus is the one who brought down the wall of hostility that divided people from God and people from people, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. When we allow racism and hatred to exist, it is literally an affront to the work of Jesus Christ. Also, we are commanded to love one another as Jesus loves us. That's just simple, basic biblical teaching. And here's another piece there. We are to be kind, compassionate, and forgiving of each other, just as God, through Christ, forgave us. This is important. This is huge. Someone who is a racist might not deserve our forgiveness. But let's pause. When it says just as Christ forgave us, if that's the case, none of us 
deserved his forgiveness. The standard is not what other people might think. The standard is the way in which Christ has forgiven us. That's the way we are called to have compassion and love and forgiveness for others. So the final piece that I would want to say there is Jesus unified the church by his work on the cross. Uh, Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 tells us that in the eyes of God, it says there is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In other words, when it comes to a person's worth and their value before their creator, Every single person has equal worth and value and dignity because of our Creator. Now, we could keep on talking about what Scripture has to say. There's so many passages we could go through. But here's the thing. The big issue is not that people don't know that hatred is wrong and love is right. That's not the biggest issue here. The bigger issue is that we don't think our internal hatred and our lack of love is that big a deal. People falsely assume that as long as I don't act on what is in my heart, it'll be okay. But Jesus was very, very clear linking the heart to our actions. Eventually, what's in the heart is going to come out through our actions. So when we're just saying, hey, as long as I don't say anything, as long as I don't do anything about this, it's okay. It's not okay in the eyes of God. He looks upon the heart. So one of the topics that I've brought up multiple times in our worldview nights is the idea of the Imago Dei, the image of God. I I need to bring that up one more time before we move forward and I invite the pastors to come up with, with me. According to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, God created everything, but there is only one part of creation that has the distinct honor of being made in the image of God. That's humanity. Because of that distinction, every human has equal worth and value in dignity before God. We have to frame this in the Imago Dei. In fact, somebody might say, is this really that big of a topic? Absolutely. It goes back to creation order itself and understanding of the gospel. So there's so many other places that we could take the conversation tonight, but hopefully that lays a basic foundation. We got more to cover, but with that being said, I am going to invite and ask you to welcome our group of pastors over to the stage this evening. So if they would, come on out and join me at this time. All right. So if you all could be seated, and they're going to grab their microphones and kind of get everything set up over here. And uh, so I am going to ask, starting with Pastor DiCarlo right next to me, I'm going to ask if each of the different pastors would just take a moment and just introduce themselves, uh, where you serve, how long you have served there. So uh, Pastor DiCarlo, why don't you get us started on that, man? All right. Okay, we good. All right. Yeah. Great evening to everyone. Um, I am DeCarlo Marcus, Senior Servant Leader of Freedom Church of Albany. Uh, We have been in existence for seven years, so we are baby baby, but um, honored to serve in in the calling and in the purpose that God has for the city of Albany, and we're excited for everything that God is going to do, and thank you, Paul, for this opportunity. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Trent Corey. I am the lead pastor of Hope City United. Uh, my wife and I, uh, Pastor Keisha, 28 years. We celebrated a marriage last, uh, this uh, past February, February the 3rd. And this is actually our 25th year of full-time ministry, Pastor. Uh, but eight years ago, uh, God called our hearts to plant a life-giving church in a city that I feel like needs it. Uh, and that's the city of Albany, Georgia, in southwest Georgia. We love the city. And thank you so much to Sherwood for hosting this night. Thank you, Pastor Paul. You're such a great friend. Uh, he's, he's a friend of pastors and a leader of leaders. 
and we thank you tonight for inviting us into this house. It's going to be a fun time, and it's also going to be a time of great growth. I believe that. Amen. Amen. My name is Rance Pettibone. Uh, I've been in the ministry for 52 years. Amen. And Amen. <laughs> I've pastored in Europe, uh, all over Europe, and in the United States. I've, I've been here for about 22 years. Uh, I have 23 grandchildren and nine great grands. <laughs> and uh, I have I have loved Albany ever since I set foot. And my desire is for the community to come together, Amen. to work together for the love of God. Amen. We haven't seen what God can do. Come on. And what God cannot do, hmm. it doesn't exist. <laughs> Come on. Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, good evening. My name is Ken Bell. I'm the baby of the group. Do y'all see that? <laughs> <laughs> but definitely grateful to be here. Uh, I've been uh, at Sherwood for 13 years as a pastor of Connections and Local Missions. Truly grateful for my pastor, uh, Paul Goddard. He has been truly a blessing in my life and in the life of our family. And uh, serving here at Sherwood and just serving the city uh, has been an incredible blessing because people look at Albany in a negative light, but I see all the things that God wants to do in Albany through the people of God. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. So I want to take just a moment and let you all know why I've asked this group of men to come on the stage tonight. And so each of them, they have a different piece that I believe God has brought together for tonight. So uh, one, Pastor DiCarlo, I got a chance to meet your mom and your grandmother here tonight. They were right there. They are. They're over on the side over here. So it was so exciting. I met them out in the atrium over there. But anyway, Pastor DiCarlo, first time I met him at lunch, I began to find out about his heart for unity, about loving people, about churches connecting together, and how we can serve the community. And I'm going to tell you, that was exciting. I, I was brand new in the city three years ago. I reached out to a lot of different pastors, and unfortunately, many wouldn't even return a phone call. So when Pastor DiCarlo wanted to get together for lunch, I was like, you're on, man. So I was excited. But God has united our hearts together for this city, and I absolutely love this brother in Christ, grateful to God for him. And so anyway, that's the reason I wanted Pastor DiCarlo to be here. Also, we got Pastor Trent right here. And so with Pastor Trent, we're around the same age, something like that. He sings far better than what I do. No question about that whatsoever. We're Georgia fans. And we're both Georgia fans. Amen on that. That's fantastic. Um, but both, we've been involved in church planting, similar desire, similar heart when it comes to ministry. But also at lunch, I found out his heart that he'd prayed over the years that God would allow him to be able to pastor a multicultural church. That's what I'd been praying for since the time God called me into vocational ministry. And there's something different about just a multi-ethnic church and a multicultural church. You might have many different ethnicities in the same room, but if it's a multicultural church, here's what I'll tell you. Everyone will feel a little bit uncomfortable at some point in a worship service. When you start blending together culture in the same room, it's, it's going to be different. But I don't know if you all already saw this. I'm about to start preaching. I, I got to hold myself. Okay. I don't know if you all already saw this, but even in the first two worship songs, God was doing something in this room through different ethnicities and ages and denominations. Just a beautiful piece. So I praise God for Pastor Trent, Pastor Pettibone. I also met him at lunch. There's a theme that's going on in my life right now. All good meetings involve lunch. But anyway, in my lunch meeting that I had with Pastor Pettibone, about 30 minutes in, he was sharing his story with me. And I was overwhelmed by the love, the grace, and the joy that was in his life. And I'm going to tell you, when you've been in ministry over 50 years and you got joy, <laughs> Listen, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength, and man has joy. And so 
I just asked him, I said, how did God develop that in your life? And he shared a story with me that he's about to share with us in a few moments. And as soon as I heard it, I was like, other people in this city need to hear his story. I love Pastor Pettibon. So grateful. And then... It's mutual. Amen. And then there's Pastor Ken. So outside of the fact that myself and Pastor Ken have a common affinity, a love, a passion to see what God will do bringing people together, there's probably no man who I find in my life that I am going to coordinate my outfits with more (laughs) than Pastor Ken. In fact, we have to wear name tags on Sunday just so people can tell us apart. We, I mean, we, we have so many of the same outfits. He's over at the security ministry, and there's been times I've been wondering to myself, does he have a camera at my house? How does he know what I'm going to be wearing before I leave the house? But I've, I've known Ken for now between seven to eight years. Ever since I've met him, I have been blown away by his love for God and his love for people. Pastor Ken has the ability to love people in the right direction in order to focus on the things that are the most important and to do things in a Christ-honoring way, and he does it exceptionally well. So anyway, I am grateful to God for each of the men that are on this panel right now. All right. So that being said, we are going to go through, and I've got a number of questions And some of these are specific to individuals. And I'm going to start the first one with Pastor Pettibone. And I just mentioned a moment ago in our first lunch meeting over at Cheddar's, we were talking. And I just asked you to share how God developed that love and that joy that's in your life. And you shared a story with me. So if you would, take a couple of minutes and just share that with the group. Well, uh, my father is a pastor. And uh, he was a sharecropper. And in Alabama, and every weekend he would give me a quarter to take me to the movie, uh, and that that bought the soda and the popcorn. And six of my friends would go. Well, one night I decided to stay and watch uh, a Frankenstein movie, <laughs> and even though I didn't see it because I was too busy hiding behind the the uh, seats. I didn't want to see him, but it got kind of late. And on the way home, I had to walk home from uptown, we call it. I was walking home, and two white guys, they caught me. And they started a fire and took some clothes hangers and marked me on my back and wrote their initials on my back. I got home and I was crying, and and, uh, from then on, I hated white folks. Every time I saw white folks, all I saw was red because I really hated them. I even prayed that God would kill them all. I I really did. I, I would pray at night. Lord, anybody do that, they don't deserve to live. And as I grew older, I still hated white folks. And then I went to Alabama, uh, University of Alabama, and uh, I got up there and they told me, nope, you can't play football here. We don't want your kind here. So I was angry again. Then I went to the military, and that's when it happened. My father kept telling me, he said, son, turn that anger loose. Because it's going to eat you up. That's right. Turn that anger loose. I said, Dad, you don't know what it's like to walk around with somebody else's initials on your butt. And I was super angry. And then in the military is where I saw some things I couldn't believe. I, I, I saw whites helping blacks, blacks helping whites. And I just, I just couldn't couldn't fathom that. And then it was during the uh, Martin Luther King days and he got killed and I got angry again. But something on the inside of me 
was pulling me. I, I couldn't figure it out to save my life. I couldn't figure it out. So I just left it alone. And I said, Lord God, when you get ready, something's going to happen. Either they're going to they gonna get off this earth and we're going to be by ourselves. <laughs> Because I really, I just, I really hated white folks. And uh, then in Vietnam, when the first time I got shot, we was in there and they was giving us blood. And really, we didn't know whose blood it was. Mm. Mm. And I found out that they, they gave me much, much blood from white folks. Because there wasn't no black folks in there. <laughs> and so, now I'm really messed up. <laughs> <laughs> so, we going, I'm going on and on and on. And then it happened. One night, I was at the club. And tears started coming out my eyes. I'm sitting in the club, walking in the club, got Chevy Regal in his hand, a cigarette in his hand. Mm. And I'm walking through there and I'm looking and tears start coming out my eyes. And in Oklahoma, they build big, big ditches mm. because the ground gets so hard to when it rains, they need a runoff. But I was walking home because I kept saying, I said, I got to go home. I, I, I can't stay like this. And when I got in, the, in that ditch, in the bottom of that ditch, walking home, it's a big ditch, I said, Lord, if this thing you want out of me, I want it out of me too. Because I was thinking about what my dad said, turn it loose. I couldn't turn it loose. So I just did what my dad told me to do. I prayed. Yes. And he said, that ditch, it was at night, in the middle of the night. That ditch lit up like a whole city, like to scare me to death. And I fell on my knees. I said, Lord, if it's your will, take all of this anger out of me. And the light went out, and the light came on in my heart. Amen. And I have not looked back <laughs> since that day. That, to me, is why I wanted everybody to hear this. There is a difference between somebody who is still in the throes of the struggle versus somebody who has met with God and God gave victory in a huge way. So one of my favorite things right now is I have a couple of voicemails I've kept from Pastor Pettibone knowing the story, and like the first thing he said is, Pastor Paul, I love you. And when I hear him say that, I know his story. Amen. That's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He, he even said it. He said, I couldn't do it myself, but I prayed and God released it. You can't, so. you can't pour old, new wine in old bottles. Yeah. You, you can't pour it in a new skin. And God cannot pour his spirit mm. in an unforgiving body. Mm, come on, man. Come on. <laughs> All right. Okay, so Pastor Trent, uh, we, we had a number of meetings that we all kind of got together as a group, and we were talking about this night, and we were praying together. And one of the things that you brought up is that you grew up in an area where you were often the only white kid either in your school or on ball teams, and it shaped your view of ethnicity and races, and a lot of that shapes who you are to this very day. So if you would, just kind of yes, tell your story right there. Yes, I grew up in Atlanta, uh, the Atlanta area, a rough area. Uh, I remember there's a little girl, her name was Charity. She was the only other white child in second grade. We went to Chapel Hill Elementary School. And I remember being bullied because, I know you can't tell this, but I was actually husky when I was little. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was younger, uh, I was a little thicker, 
and uh, I wore husky pants, and the kids, they, they were bullying me, and, there was, and they were all mostly black kids, um, and I wanted to be their friend, and they wanted to bully me, and so, so they, they, they did that a lot, and here's the truth. The truth is I could have, if I would have allowed myself, I could have allowed that to shape the way that I saw every black person yeah. in my life. Yeah. But by the grace of God, somehow, Pastor Pettibone, by the grace of God, somehow, uh, I began to play sports and I realized that I had more in common with my black brothers and sisters than I ever could have dreamed or imagined. And God did a work in my heart. And, uh, you know, I, I just learned through the years to the best of my ability, Pastor, um, that there's value in every single human being. There's, right. there's, there's potential in every single person. And I, I just love this thought. Um, my wife and I will often get our family together, and I know that many of you will do this as well. If we're somewhere on vacation or we're uh, going out, you know, we'll take a family picture, you know, and you, you know that you have to take at least 47 pictures if you take a picture yeah. because they want to get it right. But then they'll take it and they'll put a filter on it. You know what a filter is? A filter makes you look better than you actually are, okay? And you know what, Pastor? One day, as I was navigating through this in my own life, racism, hatred, love, and forgiveness, I felt like God spoke to my heart and he said, son, if you'll ever learn how to look at everybody through the Jesus filter, yeah. Yeah. it will change everything for you. That's right. So that's my encouragement for you tonight, man. Put the Jesus filter on everybody because Jesus loves everybody. Amen. Amen. Awesome. All right, so Pastor Ken, I'm coming to you at this point. Uh, you wear a lot of hats around the ministry of Sherwood. One of those is you lead the Hope Center. And for those who don't know, the Hope Center is a ministry that works on uniting together individuals and churches and organizations to serve the people of Albany. And so you're kind of like boots on the ground, just day after day, just serving. So if you would, take just a moment, if you would, how does racism and hatred negatively impact churches in the area, our ability to come together and to actually serve this city well? Well, thank you for that, that question, Pastor. And I, and I think I'm going to hit a topic that everyone is familiar with that we just came through, and that's COVID. Mm. And uh, I was going to speak at the Georgia Baptist Convention. And I was asking the Lord, Lord, what should I talk about? What should I preach? I mean, there are hundreds of pastors that are here. And so I was like, Lord, what do I say to them? And so he took me to some passages of scripture. And as I start reading those scriptures, I start remembering the work that we were doing in the community and different things. And, and the Lord said, you know, we didn't do all that we could have done. You see, while we were fighting about mass, no mass, vaccine, no vaccine, people were going to hell in a handbasket. He says, we were distracted in fighting, and these people were going to hell. Mm -hmm. And I said, Lord, forgive us, mm -hmm. because we got distracted. We, got to, we took our eyes off the mission of God mm -hmm. and start fighting between ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so now, even now, when I look at the city of Albany, Georgia, a city with incredible potential. Yes. Amen. Incredible potential. As a matter of fact, if you, if you don't realize it or not, the church is the biggest organization in Albany, Georgia, in the world. Mm. If, I just, if I just added the numbers up, say for instance, we had three to 400 churches in Albany, Georgia. Every church was filled with about 100 people. That would be 40,000 people strong to go out and serve in the name of the Lord. Mm. Do you realize the impact that we could have for the kingdom? That's right. You realize that? 40,000 people in one city, the impact that we could have for the gospel. And so I'm very passionate about this city. My hometown is Jacksonville. I love Duval County, but the Lord didn't call me there. He called me here. Yeah. And when I look at this place, the Lord says, you go there, you plant a family, you love the people, you serve well, you do what I called you to do. And you don't look at Crystal Beaches. 
far off lands that have nice houses. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all been trying to get out of here since day one. <laughs> but that's not what the Lord called us to. He called us here. And when we get here, we're not trying to leave. We're serving and we're being obedient to what the Lord's called us to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So I've got Pastor DiCarlo. So a couple of minutes on this one as well. So um, we actually came together like first time because there was a member of your church who also attended Sherwood Christian Academy and uh, passed away unexpectedly. And so our two churches came together in order to serve at the funeral. And through that, just common interest came out. You've been gracious to bring your worship team to come out and to serve at one of our youth nights, myself and you. We've worked together as far as trying to unite pastors together and churches together in the city. So if you would, from the perspective of a guy who's focused on unity, on togetherness, on connecting churches, tell me if you would... What has racism brought into this city right now? I think that, um, truthfully speaking, one of the things that we struggle with sometimes is understanding that tragedy creates equality. Hmm. When you hurt, there was no such thing as a black hurt or a white hurt or a yeah. Mexican hurt Come or on. Asian hurt. Hurt is hurt. That's right. And one of the things that you begin to experience sometimes is that we feel like ethnically there are different things that we struggle with in relation to handling racism. So I think that one of the things that has happened through racism being um, present in our city is the fact that we've created silos mm. and we're divisive in how we approach certain things because we feel like no one will understand our plight. Yeah. But one of the things I love about how Christ demonstrated his message of the gospel is that when he demonstrated the message of the gospel, there was no ethnic message. It was mm. the message of the kingdom. That's good. And he was able to reach every level of humanity through the message of the kingdom because he understood it didn't matter what ethnic group they came from, they were all sin sick. That's right. And he was able to minister healing and minister wholeness to them through the revelation of the gospel. And so... I think that one of the things that we have to war against and pray against and operate against is making sure that there were no silos mm. in how we approach healing. Because at the end of the day, if I hurt and you hurt, it may be a different experience, but it feels the same. That's right. And what we have to learn how to do is make sure that we don't allow how we see things to create a, a divisive approach, which then makes me insensitive to what it is that you're experiencing, but recognizing that when we hurt, there was a common prayer that can be released that will minister healing to the common soul of humanity. That's good, man. That's good. I, I, I love the fact, once again, even in that, I, I love how you said it like there's, there's no ethnic hurt in that. Hurt is hurt. And so even a lot of what Pastor Pettibone had shared as far as him being in the military and seeing that they were, the common struggles were happening regardless of ethnicity, um, the common answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, okay, we got to move along because apparently we talk more than what we plan to talk right now. So uh, anyway, I, I, I want this one to be kind of fast. And by the way, that is also a problem that comes when you stick five pastors up on a panel and you say, everybody has two minutes of peace. That goes in one ear and out the other. Nobody pays any attention to that whatsoever. So anyway, real fast on this, if, if you all would, I, I would love it if you all could give maybe one statement each just on the, the side of what happens if racism and hatred are not addressed by the church. Like one statement each on, on what happens if it's not addressed. So I'm come down over here with Pastor Ken. When racism and hatred is not addressed, you will see a God's presence removed from the church. Mm. God's presence. Manifest presence of God, power of God. Yes, sir. I really believe, I really believe when you see another person and you don't see Christ in them, you need to go back and pray. Amen. <laughs> I don't care what, if they're Asian, African-American, uh, whatever. 
when you look them in the face, if you say that you are a Christian, you belong to a church, you look that person in the face, and if you don't see God, go back and pray again. Because he said it. I made them in my image and my likeness. That's right. That's right. So if you don't see, if you don't see God, you know you're out of step. Go back and pray again. <laughs> it, it, only, it only takes a minute. Then come back and look again. That's good. That's good. Pastor Trent. You know, Pastor, I think when racism and hatred is in the church, it is basically an invitation to missional failure of what the gospel actually is all about. Yeah. It just can't succeed. That's right. When there's hate that's greater than love and racism that's greater than forgiveness. So it's the gospel. That's good. We got to love each other and we got to love each other well. So that's good. Yeah. That's good. Pastor DeCarlo. If we do not address racism and hatred, then one of the things I see is that we preach an incomplete message mm. because there is no way that we can preach the gospel and preach healing and allow racism and hatred to exist in yes. our churches. Amen. That's powerful, Amen. man. Love it. Okay, so real fast, um, if you would share each of you, maybe just a moment, like if there was a passage, say somebody wants to go back and study from Scripture and say, how do I get God's perspective on loving people well, on dealing with hatred, something like that. What are some stories or passages that you all would encourage them to go through and to study? We'll just kind of open it up right there. So, okay. I'll, go, I'll go to Romans. <laughs> all right. I'll go to Romans 12, uh, verses 4 and 5. It says, just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. That's good. That's good. Pastor Trent. John 13, 34 and 35. A new command I give you. This is Jesus talking, by the way. So when Jesus talks, you should listen. Yeah. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. Pastor Paul mentioned it earlier, but verse 35, I love it. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. Yeah. Not if you hate one another. Yeah. If you love one another. And not if you just tolerate one Come another. Come on now. <laughs> but good. love one another. Like that's, a, that's this, an active step. By this. That's right. The one thing. Jesus said this is the one thing. The one thing that he would say be, would be our identifier. Yeah. That is my identifier in the church and in the world as a general rule as believers. This one thing. Do you love one another? That's good. That's powerful. Yes, sir. Not like. That's right. <laughs> All right. right. Pastor DiCarlo, what do you think, man? Yes, sir. Um, John 4. Because many of the times when we read John 4, we always focus upon the fact that he was healing her from adultery. Mm -hmm. But truthfully speaking, he was also healing racism. Mm -hmm. She was a Samaritan. Samaritan. Come on. Yeah. Samaritans and Jews did not deal with each other. Yeah. So he was creating a bridge of reconciliation through healing, mm -hmm. through talking to a woman that racially he had no business talking to. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I think that we need to do is read John 4 and understand beyond the adultery, he healed her heart to recognize that though she was not viewed as a pure Jew, yeah. she was accepted at the same time. Ah, that's good. That's good. Okay. So. I, 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 I don't remember all the scriptures. Okay. But I'm saying all of them. Yeah. <laughs> so what you're saying is start in the book of Genesis and end in the maps and listen, guaranteed you're going to cover listen, it. Listen, I preached this morning. I said, when the foundations crumble, yeah. what do the Christians say? Mm. When the foundations crumble mm. and our foundations are crumbling. Yeah. So yeah. what do you do? You remember what he said. God so loved the world, John 3, 16, yeah. that he gave his only begotten son. Yes. That whosoever believeth in him. Mm. That's all it takes. Mm. Believeth in him. And we've got to preach it. Yeah. And you've got to preach it. 
It's good to sit up there and watch a preacher, you know, catch on, you know, be smoking every Sunday morning, and you come to see if he's going to catch on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering when he started on that smoking every Sunday morning. I was like, hmm. All right, we're going there tonight. Okay. What kind of church is this? Yeah, I understand, man. Oh, okay. Hey, real fast. I don't know if you all are hearing this over and over and over. Gospel, 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 prayer, prayer, prayer. Jesus, 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 love, 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 over and over, all of those pieces are coming out. It's not that we don't know the answers. We just don't like to take the steps that are necessary in order to experience that. Okay, so final piece right here. Um, kind of we'll, we'll go into like next steps and we got to do this, honestly, like a minute and a half a piece here. So, uh, all right, starting with DiCarlo, man, it's all going to be sitting on your shoulders right now. Okay, so if you would, like for a person who's saying, I want practical steps of what I, I need to do. Like, I want to be a part of the solution. What are a couple of practical steps you would give? Uh, number one, understand 2 Corinthians chapter number five. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. So the assignment that has been given to every Bible is to reconcile, not only to Christ, but reconcile ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, one of the things I would encourage you to do is listen to the story of the person that does not look like you. Amen. Because yeah. their story is going to give you the understanding as to why they feel the way that they feel. And when you understand story, there's a different level of compassion that is breeded in understanding that story. So take the time to build relationships, no matter what it is, Starbucks, uh, nukes, whatever you do, just build a relationship so that you can understand that story. Understanding that story is going to create the compassion that you need to create the path towards reconciliation. That's good. And you kept in a minute and a half. That's awesome. All right, Pastor Trent, come on, bro. I'm watching the clock right now. There you go, so, man. <laughs> honestly, uh, I'll just give a little analogy. A uh, couple years ago, I had a bunch of trees um, that, that needed to be cut down, and some of them looked really healthy. And some of them looked really bad, but they were all the same type of tree. And I couldn't figure out what's going on with these trees. So I decided let's just take them all out because some of them look good and some of them don't look good at all. Mm. And there's got to be a problem. And so we started cutting them down. And when we cut them all down, uh, what we realized, even on the ones that looked good on the outside, the heart of the tree was rotted out. Mm. Yeah. Good, man. Mm. And a next step in your life as a believer is to check your own heart yeah. and look in the mirror and say what Dr. Martin Luther King said. He said, uh, darkness can't drive out darkness. Yes. That's Only right. light can do that. That's right. He said, hate can't drive out hate. Mm. Only love can do that. That's good. That's good. And for me, it's, it's just simple. When you see another person, look them in the face. And if you don't see God, go back and pray again. But there are two books, two books that have been, that have been driven my, driving my life since God came into my life. One is B Bill Bright. It's called The Mature Christian. Mm. It teaches you how to be mature. Mm. Mature, because we want to be mature. We want to don't be, be like a child, blow the weight. Yeah. And there's a book called Love, Acceptance, and Forgiveness. I bet I've given a thousand of those away. Your pastor got one. Yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> but I give them away because they're teaching us how to be mature Christians. And we need to be mature. We don't need to... Do the same thing over and over. Our children do the same thing over and over. We need to become mature Christians. Good. Pastor Ken. I think they're going to bring a picture up here on the screen, and this is the best example that I can provide. Uh, one of our Connect groups meets together, and if you look at this picture, you see multi-ethnic. Uh, you see just different types of people. This is what it looks like to get over racism. That's good. 
You've got to be willing. Frank Griffin and I talked about this. You've got to be willing to put your feet under other people's tables on, and Amen. get to know people. Yes. And when you do that, you break down the walls of racism. Yeah, Amen. that's awesome. All right, so here's what we would like to do to close out this part of the service. We'll, we're going to have prayer. Myself and Pastor DiCarlo are going to lead in a final part of prayer. Um, and then afterwards, we're going to have a couple of songs of worship. We want to worship out of this room. We want the focus to be on Jesus as we leave this room. But as we come into this final time of prayer, um, I don't know where you might be. It, it might be that there are people in the room who, as we're praying, they would want to come forward. They would want to, to get together and to come at the altar and say, I want God to use me in order to be a part of the solution in this city. If that's the case, we want to welcome you to come and to be here. So at this time, if everybody would just stand with us, and we're going to lead in this final prayer. Our worship team is going to be making their way up this direction. And uh, as we get started, just know you are more than welcome not only to, to come and to pray at the altar with us, you're also welcome at the same time uh, to be able to just come forward as we're going to worship and have a final time of uh, singing together. So, Pastor DiCarlo, if you would, would you get us started right here? Just praying over the city, praying over the churches, and God's blessing in this. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Father, for your grace. We thank you for your heart. We thank you for your compassion towards us, your love towards us, your mercy towards us. Father, we thank you, Father, that your heart is toward the city of Albany. We thank you, Father, that your love is shining bright upon this city. And we bless you, Father, for we know that this event, this time of gathering, exists because your love is toward this city. Yes. We thank you, Father, that you through your love have unearthed certain things. And we bless you, Father, tonight that you have given clarity, you've given insight, and you've given understanding. And you've spoken over this city concerning the spirit of reconciliation. So we thank you, Father, tonight that through the spirit of reconciliation, racial issues would be able to be healed in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray over every church in this city. I thank you for the leaders. I thank you for the graces and the anointings that you've given to every leader. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you would begin to move their hearts and allow them, Father, to create passageways, create bridges, Father, to connect with churches that don't look like them, sound like them, worship like them. I pray, Father, that you would give them the boldness and Come the maturity yes. to be able, Father, to connect with other leaders and connect with other churches. I thank you that we would not see ourselves as individual houses, but we would see ourselves as the church of Albany, and we would understand, Father, that you called each of us to the ministry of healing, to the ministry of deliverance, and to the ministry of reconciliation. So we speak Speak your blessings now upon every heart in this room that has heard what you have declared. I decree and declare now strength in the name of Jesus to be upon the hearts of your people. That as we move into the place of racial and ethnic healing, that you, Father, through your grace, will be at the forefront and be at the middle of all that we do. I pray now that you will begin to even now minister unto any hindrance, any bias, any stereotype that we may have hidden in our hearts, uprooted tonight and cause healing and deliverance to manifest in our lives. In Jesus' name, yes. amen. Yes, yes. Heavenly Father, we are unbelievably grateful, God, that you've given us this night to not only address things biblically, but also in practical steps. Lord, every one of the, the churches that's represented in this room right now, Lord, it has people that you have bought with your blood those who name the name of Jesus, those who have been reconciled to you through the powerful gospel of Jesus Christ. So Lord, we pray tonight that you would allow there to be hope that is in this room, that we would begin to recognize that Lord, you are doing an amazing work if, you would, if we would allow you simply to do what you desire to do. God, apart from you, we cannot do this. Lord, apart from you, there's going to be nothing but brokenness and despair. Apart from you, God, there, there is no hope. But Lord, tonight, over and over again, the focus has been back on the gospel, back on prayer, back on Jesus, back on the Holy Spirit, back on you alone doing what only you can do. So Lord, we come out with our hands up and we surrender before you. 
And we ask you, Lord, tonight as we worship, Lord, may it give us a view of what it will one day be when we surround your throne with people of every nation, tribe, and tongue singing your praises. Lord, we give you thanks, we give you praise. And Lord, as we sing out of this room, God, may we remember the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.